Hello and welcome to another episode of the book club, uh, the Risk Five Reader. Uh, it's been a while since we've done the Risk Five Reader. <clears throat> I think it's well overdue that we get back to this book, and uh, I'm currently waiting on uh, micro semi micro semi however you say their name. Uh, their company, uh, they need to get back to me about my uh, expansion board. I don't know if I have some bad hardware or what, but uh, they haven't gotten back to me yet. So I might need to shoot them uh, an email asking about the status of my ticket soon. But uh, until we get that resolved, uh, we can maybe get some, some of our other side series, you know, other... Um, Kind of side projects a little bit of uh, love to those so and like i say the risk five reader one is well overdue i referenced this book like uh anytime we're doing like risk five assembly of any kind so pretty much every time we do computer organization and design for example i'm referencing the risk five reader it's uh, an absolutely great book and a invaluable reference uh, I always want that by my side to reference when I'm uh, doing stuff with Risk Risk Five. So I uh, highly recommend this book. So we should probably, you know, actually continue reading it on the on the show. <laughs> uh, so uh, we got through two dot three, I believe, or at least we started on 2.3 let me see here yeah we got through 2.3 where we talked about uh, the program counter being uh, not a um, general purpose register on risk 5 that was like the last thing we we covered so let's go on to uh, 2.4, RV32i integer computation. And then uh, I'll also say there's a, a definition in the margin. Uh, so I'm just looking here. It's been a while, so I'm kind of refreshing myself a bit um i don't know if we read this last time or not i'll, I'll just start by reading what's in the margin here it says uh, pipelining it's uh used by all but the cheapest processors today to get good performance like an industrial assembly line they get higher throughput by overlapping the execution of many instructions at once to pull this off the processors predict branch outcomes which they can do with more than 90% accuracy. When they mispredict, they re-execute instructions. Early microprocessors had a five-stage pipeline, which meant five instructions overlapped execution. Recent ones have more than 10 pipeline stages. And, uh, you know, what they're talking about here with uh, branch prediction, uh, you know, speculative execution, uh, is uh, should be noted this is what led to Spectre uh, the security vulnerability Spectre and the related uh, meltdown as well and um, uh, I don't know if it's possible to have these types of features in a processor without having uh, those kinds of vulnerabilities from from you know looking over the paper in the past about Spectre, it certainly sounded like you know <laughs> it's kind of a fundamental problem that you're going to run into if you're trying to do this kinds of optimizations in hardware. And um, the security researcher, I believe it was the guy involved with uh, writing that paper, maybe not, but some security guy, um, and I believe. He had been a coworker of Megan Wax at a previous company, and he was 
I don't know if he gave a talk at Sci Five or some Risk Five related thing. There was some I don't remember who the guy was either, but some guy gave a talk <laughs> about Spectre after that uh, happened. After that paper was published, uh, very shortly after that, uh, um, a security researcher gave a talk about it, kind of advising the Risk Five community about you know what can be done, and uh, the suggestion there was um, to have a dedicated core which is uh, slower so like a like what we have in the high five unleashed or in the high five one or you know any of the kind of risk five chips we have today which aren't to the point of being so advanced that they're doing these crazy you know high performance things um, having a chip like this that's simpler as a secure chip basically so you have a core that is secure and basically that just means it doesn't do the fancy optimizations and hardware and then uh you know when you want high performance you use the other cores which are your normal cores that you use for normal processing of stuff and so if, it, if you don't need to worry about um, the security of what you're doing then you can get that good high performance by using your normal high performance cores but then when you need to do something that does need that security that you really don't want to be vulnerable to something like Spectre then you switch over to executing that code securely on the you know the secure core which like I say is just a slower core that doesn't do the fancy optimizations uh, uh, that's kind of what the suggestion was back then and I've heard that like the the boom uh, processor which is uh you know supposed to be one of these fancy cores that's out of order and you know does speculative execution and these types of things i've heard that uh, there's some research with that of trying to do like a secure out of order processor i don't know i i have no idea what's going on there in that uh, uh design space what people are doing with that but i've heard something ab about that i think i saw something about that on like twitter at one point uh, but I didn't look into it at all. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know if it's possible to do such a thing. But uh, at the very least, you can do what that guy was suggesting of having a, a slower core that's secure. But uh, I just thought I'd mention that because, you know, that's uh, whenever you, you hear about these types of things like branch prediction and speculative execution and out of order execution and, you know, fancy pipelining stuff. Uh, this gets into the territory of, you know, you're getting high performance, but you also need to consider that you're potentially making your processor less secure. There's kind of a, a fundamental trade-off, it seems, between, you know, the really high performance stuff and the really secure stuff, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, that's just something to keep in mind. But uh, anyway, let's uh, keep keep reading here. So uh, 2.4 is RB32i integer computation. And it says Appendix A gives details of all the RISC-V instructions, including formats and opcodes. And uh, that's what I reference pretty much very heavily. I also kind of like to thumb through and see the uh, some of the example uh, snippets of RISC-V assembly code they give in the book. And there are some useful like tables and stuff earlier in the book. Um, and like chapter three, especially, I think has some useful tables in it. Uh, but yeah, the appendix is one of the main uh, kind of highlights of this book, in my opinion. Although we did find recently in computer organization and design that there is a mistake in uh, the appendix. Um, at least one mistake uh, from what I can tell. Um, what was it? Um, let me see. It wasn't JAL. Was it AUIPC or call the pseudo instruction? Uh, 
Uh, it wasn't that. Yeah, the call pseudo instruction. Uh, I want to point this out. I don't. I looked online, and I wasn't able to find an errata for this book. Um, maybe I just failed to find it. I don't know if there is or not. But uh, I'm quite certain this is a mistake. Uh, the call pseudo instruction in the appendix. Uh, it says writes the address of the next instruction. Uh, PC plus 8 to uh, the destination register, then sets the PC to the symbol. Uh, and it says it expands to AUIPC followed by a jump in link register, JALR. Um, and again, in the, the top right, um, it shows uh, basically the way the appendix works is they give the, the name of the instruction um, and the arguments it takes. Uh, and then below that, uh, it says like what the uh, the name of the instruction stands for. It says whether it's a pseudo instruction, and uh, it says like uh, what um, what type of Risk Five um, extensions it's uh, supported in. So like the call one, it says it's a it's a call. It's a pseudo instruction. It's RV thirty two I and RV sixty four I, and then below that they give the description of what it does, and uh, in like the top right, uh, it has kind of like a um, a description of what it does in terms of uh, I guess you'd say in terms of like C syntax sort of, uh, and um, yeah, that has the PC plus eight as well in it. Uh, it should be PC plus four. And if you look at JAL and JALR, uh, which I just did when I was thumbing through this to see uh, what the, the mistake was again, uh, JAL and uh, JALR both say plus four, which is correct. Uh, so I don't know why call says plus eight, but uh, I'm quite confident that is a, a mistake in the appendix. So um, that is one notable uh, notable uh, mistake in this book. And I, like I say, I don't know if there is an errata, but you know, if you're watching this series, uh, now you're aware that that is one, uh, one issue in this book. But um, uh, regardless, it's this is a you know a great reference. <coughs> this book is my uh, go-to reference. So, <coughs> excuse me, I swallowed some water wrong. <coughs> Apologies for that. But uh, yeah. So, continuing on here, uh, it says, in this section and similar sections of the following chapters, we give an ISA overview that should be sufficient for knowledgeable assembly language programmers, as well as highlight the features that demonstrate the seven ISA metrics from chapter one. Uh, now, it's been a long time since I've read this book. If you're watching it on YouTube, maybe Maybe it's a little fresher in your mind if you're watching these all at the same time. But uh, I'd like to just go back and refresh myself on the the seven metrics they're talking about. Okay, so the seven metrics were cost, uh, simplicity, performance, isolation of architecture from implementation, uh, room for growth, program size, and ease of programming slash compiling slash linking. All right. So the uh, simple uh, arithmetic instructions add and sub 
logical instructions and or an exclusive R and shift instructions, uh, shift left logical, shift right logical, and shift right arithmetic in figure 2.1 are just as you would expect in any ISA. They read two 32-bit values from registers and write a 32-bit result to the destination register. RB32I also offers immediate versions of these instructions. Unlike ARM32, immediates are always sign extended so that they can be negative when needed, which is why is there, no, there is no need for an immediate version of sub. Okay, now, uh, I was thinking sub was a pseudo instruction though. Isn't it just a, a pseudo instruction for an add with a negative um, a negative um, operand, or I mean like a, a negated operand. Uh, I guess not. Well, I, I guess that makes sense because um, in the hardware that's what it would be doing. But uh, you need to have the control line, like you need to have a, a signal go down the control line to tell it to do a sub instead of an add. So you would have a separate instruction for that. I guess that makes sense. But uh, you'd, you'd use the same adder hardware uh, for doing addition and subtraction. Okay, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's pretty cool how if you look at the, the base ISA of RISC-V, it's really a nice, simple architecture. There's very little to it. You know, you've got your add and subtract and or exclusive R. You've got, you know, your three variants of shift. You've got your set less than. Uh, You've got your your branches and your jumps, your loads and stores, and then uh, your CSRs. Where did I put those? Oh, your fences, your environment break and call, and your CSRs, right? So there's really not much to the base ISA. It's quite simple. Uh, there, it's kind of big in the sense that there is. Uh, well, not big compared to something like x86, but <laughs> it's kind of bigger than just that in the sense that there's different variants of like, you know, adding or adding with an immediate or, you know, the unsigned variants of certain instructions, you know, but uh, like the basic primitives are, are, you know, it's just a handful of different concepts, basically, you know, you have your branches, your jumps. Your add, your subtract, you, you know, these guys, these guys, these guys over here, these guys over here, and here and here, right? <laughs> like, it's a very, a very small set of, of stuff that you've got here. And uh, that's kind of, kind of nice that, you know, it, you can fit it all in your head. It's, it's very tangible. You can hold it in your hand, you know, uh, that there's so few. Uh, base instructions in the the base ISA. Which is very nice, but then of course in practice for you know high performance uh, processors and stuff you want more than this typically you know you're typically you want more than just what this provides and uh, RISC-V is really nice in that it's an you know extendable architecture it's uh, modular by design and so, you know, that's something that uh, I was just, you know, talking about on Twitter, not on this account, but on my personal account. Um, so, uh, So Casey very recently did his meow hash thing, which is just a uh, really fast hashing for uh, doing like really big uh, hashing really fast. And um, Miblo suggested 
uh, that ID one uh, of, uh, you know, port it for risk five, basically. Uh, so, uh, Morden's did, uh, um, an ARM version and, uh, Miblo said risk five next. And, uh, you know, Meow is really built on the concept of having AES in hardware. It doesn't really make sense to do it in software. Although, uh, Martin's, I, I think his name is pronounced Martin's. <laughs> it has an S on the end. Uh, but you know, I, I am no good with pronouncing names, but he, uh, he did, um, he actually did a software implementation. Uh, right here, and it gets uh, 0.87 bytes per cycle on an i7, he says, um, which is a lot, a lot slower than uh, what you're getting with uh, um, the the hardware, the, the AES hardware. It's um, like theoretically up to 16 bytes per cycle uh, that it can hash. Uh, the meow hash using AES stuff. And um, so he's uh, he's getting less than one byte a cycle in his uh, his software implementation, right? Uh, so I don't, you know, <laughs> I, I never even considered the idea of doing like a software implementation. I just kind of wrote that off as like, well, you know, that kind of defeats the, 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 the whole point of the, the, the uh, concept, right? Uh, so, um, I don't know if I can easily show you what I mean exactly, but, um, basically, it would be nice if this was linked to the original thread by Casey. Uh, so apologies for going on this digression here, but uh, I just want to kind of give you, give you some context of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, yeah, Casey did uh, meow hash and he says it's a high speed hash function. Uh, Basically, it's a drop-in replacement for uh, SHA-1 uh, because it was too slow for his purposes. And uh, he said, to our surprise, we found a lack of a published, well-optimized uh, large data hash, hash function. Um, and uh, if you look at it, it's not like this is uh, really not to, not to discredit Casey or anything. But it's not like he's um, come up with anything revolutionary. <laughs> it's just that there was kind of a, an odd gap in the market that no one had uh, done this. Uh, uh, basically, all he's done is taken the the AES instructions that are you know built into our CPUs today, and uh, as well as considered the the upcoming uh, instructions, the VAES instruction, um, and he's just you know. Uh, made it go fast, you know? <laughs> He's just taken that and uh, made a really fast hash. Um, so if you look at the source on GitHub, you'll see that the concept is really pretty simple. Um, so basically, the way this thing works is... Uh, it uses uh, like uh, vector 
vector instructions. So you've got uh, uh, basically four lanes of these uh, uh, vector vector instructions that are happening, and um, yeah, essentially all he does is he does the the built-in AES stuff uh, over these vectors, uh, and then he just merges them at the end uh, in a in a I guess a clever way. Uh, I don't know how clever it is because I'm not a I'm not a crypto person, but it seems pretty straightforward, right? That he's just taking these built-ins, you know, these are instructions that the processor has, and he says, okay, well, we can do this across, you know, four lanes and get the, you know, the maximum performance out of this thing that the hardware provides. Like the hardware is built to be able to do this. It's like, well, let's just do, you know, <laughs> as much as you know as optimally as the hardware can. Uh, just do these AES instructions, right? Um, and uh, at the end, just kind of like mix the results together into into a single hash. And I, you know, that's the only part that I imagine would have some cleverness involved in it. I think, and uh, I don't know exactly how uh, clever it is, but uh, like I say, just skimming over it, it looks like it's it's pretty simply just you know using the built-in, you know, the hardware that we've got to accelerate this sort of thing. And uh, that's about all there is to it. So it doesn't really make much sense to do it in software when it's, you know, the whole concept here is to just, you know, do a bunch of these AES things and then, you know, merge the results at the end, right? So yeah, but um, so you see that with a hundred and twenty-eight bit wide AES, he's getting uh, a maximum of sixteen bytes per clock cycle, and with the the VAES instruction, uh, which would be two fifty-six uh, bit wide vectors that it would use. Uh, that would be able to do 32 bytes per clock. So, um, and then with 512, uh, you'd get up to 64 bytes per clock. And so typically you're not even going to be hitting the 16 because uh, you, you might be uh, memory bound. Like you're only going to be able to keep up with the 16 per cycle if you're like in cache. Uh, if you're having to, to go out to main memory, you're not going to be even hitting the, the 16 bytes per cycle, right? So the idea is it's it's just a really fast hashing thing that's built on AES in hardware. And uh, what I was pointing out is that um, right now in RISC-V, we don't have a crypto extension standardized but i believe there's one if you just google for this there's like a pdf uh with slides from micro semi um so like you know if i just say um risk 5 aes And yeah, first result here, you can see kind of what's being proposed. I don't know if there's better documentation anywhere of what's what's kind of in the works here, but basically what it's looking like we're going to have for RISC-V is um, there's going to be a Y extension, and it depends on the V extension. So you can see uh, RV32 IVY, and they're saying using letter Y for the RISC-V cryptographic extensions, which is not yet approved. But uh, that would be kind of the, the proposed extensions that they're talking about here. And you can see, you know, just coming through this, the idea is that uh, uh, you'll use a vector opcode called vcrypt, uh, which again is using the, the vector extensions to RISC-V. And then uh, 
you can see in here that it has like AES stuff. And um, I imagine it will be pretty similar to what you can do uh, with uh, like x86 today and ARM and stuff like that. Uh, and I don't know what the status would be in terms of having uh, compiler intrinsics for it. But uh, at the very least, uh, if we had a standard uh, published, we could do a version of MeowHash uh, that does this AES stuff um, using, uh, you know, what the standard says, just doing inline assembly. But uh, ideally, we can get some uh, compiler intrinsics for this as well. And so uh, that would maybe be worth hitting people up on, like the RISC-V IRC, uh, some RISC-V IRC channels, talking to people there, seeing what they have to say about the status of that sort of thing. Um, so I might talk to some people about that, I don't know. But uh, I'd be interested in porting MeowHash uh, it would be fun to learn more about AES and the specifics of this stuff. And uh, Martins was chiming in with some other inter uh, interesting information about this stuff as well, that uh, you can do multiple AES in parallel with bit slicing, apparently. Uh, uh, with So you can do multiple of these in parallel with regular bitwise ops, but he says it might not be that useful for Meow. And uh, he even has some example stuff. So some interesting discussions there. But uh, the reason I uh, wanted to highlight this is because we're talking about, uh, you know, how it's really nice how the base ISA is really simple. But on the flip side of that, uh, you can add uh, extensions for specific purposes to accelerate very specific tasks. Uh, RISC-V is really designed for that type of thing. And that's kind of what uh, the designers of RISC-V have said they feel it's kind of the path forward for uh, for processor design. Now that we've kind of hit, uh, you know, the limit in terms of Moore's Law, we've, you know, they say Moore's Law is dead. We're pretty much hitting the limit uh, in terms of, you know, how densely we can pack transistors and such. Uh, I mean, there's still further we can go with it, but uh, it's at the point where we're, you know, we're not keeping up with the uh, exponential growth that we've enjoyed for for such a long time in the industry. You know, <laughs> we're, we're kind of coming up to the, the, the end of that. And so the path forward is really to, you know, have your your general purpose stuff, and then have, in addition to that, hardware specialized for very, you know, specific tasks. And so you have stuff like, uh, you know, people doing deep learning or making, uh, like uh, Google has their, their tensor processing units and GPUs are kind of getting extended with that sort of thing as well. And then, uh, you know, like, general purpose processors are getting things like vector extensions and uh, cryptographic extensions like this. And, you know, these are enabling very specific uh, types of applications to, you know, accelerate those types of workloads. And it seems like that's going to kind of be the path forward for hardware design is, you know, we've kind of figured out everything there is for general purpose computing, and now it's all about special purpose. You know, it's all about making that, you know, special hardware for specific tasks to, you know, be accelerated beyond what you can do with your your general purpose hardware. And that's kind of where the, where the money's at these days, it seems. So uh, this is a, you know, a great example of that. Uh, uh, so like I say, from from what we can see here, it looks like this sort of thing is coming down the pipeline, these AES uh, vector type uh, instructions with a, a cryptographic extension. It seems that's in the pipeline, but I don't know if there is like a, 
a draft of the proposal that can be seen publicly online or you know maybe if we talk to people on irc maybe there are people that can privately <laughs> uh, go into details on that i don't know you know maybe maybe you get more insight if you're a, like a you know a paying uh uh participant in the the risk five um foundation you know uh maybe you get more insight into the development uh, that way i don't know uh but uh I, I I'm not aware of any public information about this stuff yet, other than what you can find just Googling for this, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see when and how uh, cryptographic extensions make it into the the standard. Um, but this is where it stands today. There is currently nothing as far as I know of, just some proposals that apparently exist according to some slides. <laughs> That's kind of where we're at right now. But yeah, like I say, uh, I just want to you know point out I will happily do a, a RISC-V version of Meow, uh, but I'm kind of waiting for that uh, to be more, you know, standardized. But anyway, uh, getting back to the book here, right now we're not focused on uh, extensions to accelerate very specific tasks. We're interested in learning about just the, the base uh, instruction set architecture. So let's see what more it has to say about that. So uh, uh, where were we? Programs can generate a Boolean value from the result of a comparison. To accommodate sh such cases, uh, RB32I offers a set less than instruction, uh, which sets the destination register to one if the first operand is less than the second or zero otherwise. As one, as one would expect, there is a signed version and an unsigned version, that's SLT and SLTU respectively for signed and unsigned integers, as well as uh, immediate versions for, for both. So that's SLTI and SLTIU. As, as we shall see, while RV32I branches can check for all relationships between two registers, some conditional expressions involve relationships between many pairs of registers. Uh, the compiler or assembly language programmer could use SLT and the logical instructions and or and exclusive or to resolve more elaborate conditional expressions. Uh, the two remaining integer computation instructions, uh, figure 2.1, help with assembly and linking. Load upper immediate loads a 20-bit constant into the most significant 20 bits of a register. Uh, it can uh, be followed by a standard immediate instruction to create a 32-bit constant from only two 32-bit RV32I instructions. Add upper immediate to PC supports two instruction sequences to access arbitrary offsets from the uh, PC for both control flow transfers and data accesses. The combination of an AUI PC and the 12-bit uh, immediate in a JLR can transfer control to any 32-bit PC relative address, while an AUI PC plus the 12-bit immediate offset in a regular loader star instruction can access any 32-bit PC relative data address. So uh, to summarize what they're saying there is that basically there's kind of a, a little bit of a, a hack in the, <laughs> in the uh, instruction set architecture here. Uh, it's a pretty simple concept. Um, so let me find the diagram. right here. 
uh, the different instruction encodings. So basically the idea here, oh, and by the way, they got rid of the J type. Uh, that's no longer a thing. Uh, so I believe the B type is still around there. But uh, anyway, um, basically you see there is, you know, only so many bits of immediate in an, that you can pack into an instruction like a 12-bit immediate or a 20-bit immediate, you know, you can't use all 32 bits for a um, an immediate. And so if you want to do things that need 32 bits, uh, <laughs> you, you kind of you have a problem there. So, um, the way they get around this is basically uh, you can do a load upper immediate or a um, AUI PC. Those are kind of the two hacky instructions that let you uh, get around the fact that you can't pack a full 32 bits of immediate into an instruction, right? So uh, the way AUI PC works is that uh, uh, well, I should say the way a jump and link works is uh, basically there is uh, you you have an offset and then you're you're jumping PC like where the current program counter is you're jumping by a certain offset from that from that place right and uh, you know you can pack that offset into an immediate. But then you have the problem that you can't do full 32-bit addressing, right? Because the offset can only get you as far as however many bits there are in that offset, right? And you're limited by the fixed, you know, fixed width instruction encoding. So if you want to get around that, what you need to do is uh, you need to basically use a register and um, the whole concept of uh, um, AUIPC is that uh, you can take the current value of the program counter and then you can add like the the upper you know 20 bit immediate to the PC and store that into a register in a single instruction right that's the AUIPC and then uh, what you do is you do the jump and link register instruction. So what you're doing is you're jumping and then the offset is going to be the 12, you know, the 12 bit immediate, so the low 12 bits of the number. So this was the, you know, the upper 20 bits. Well, then the remaining low 12 bits you put as the offset and you use the register uh, that you just did the AUIPC to. Uh, you use that register plus the offset to create the full address of, of where you're jumping to, right? And so the combination of the AUIPC, putting a value in a register, and then the offset encoded within the jump instruction, you're able to get the full 32 bits, basically. Uh, and then uh, low to upper immediate is, uh, you know, basically the same the same concept where you're building a immediate in the you know it's the same trick where <laughs> uh, when you have instructions that uh, you know you can't pack the full immediate into the instruction, then what you can do is you can load the upper bit of the immediate into a register, and then you can use the the remaining uh, 12 bits as like the offset as part of the instruction or, you know, uh, added in separately or, you know, something like that. Uh, but uh, basically it's just you have these two instructions that let you put an upper 20 bits of immediate into a register and uh, the AUIPC one also adds it to the, the program counter, uh, like adds the program counter and the upper 20 bits together it's a it's a bit of a confusing name because uh it doesn't write back to the program counter right it takes 
the current value of the program counter and the 20-bit immediate, adds them together and stores them in a destination register, not back in, into the PC. So uh, the name is like add upper immediate to program counter, but it's not adding to the program counter in the sense that it's not storing to the program counter. It's just adding the value of the program counter and the immediate together and storing that somewhere else, right? But like I say, these are just little hacks to get around uh, <laughs> the fact that you have limited space to work with in your instruction encoding. That's really all it is. Uh, uh, so that's all you need to know about those, really. So let's uh, continue reading here. So uh, yeah, we finished that page. Now we're looking at uh, page 19. We have figure 2.4, the registers of RV32I. And it says chapter three explains the RISC-V calling convention, uh, the rationale behind the various pointers, SP, GP, TP, and FP, saved registers S0 through S11, and temporaries T0 through T6. And figure 2.1 and table 20.1 of uh, Waterman and Asanovic 2017 is the basis of this figure. And I believe uh, what they're talking about there of uh, Waterman and Asanovic 2017, uh, I believe they're referring to the uh, user ISA manual. So you can find an equivalent table uh, in there. Uh, let me just verify that because I'm pretty sure that's what they're talking about here. So let's see. Oh, here we go. I've got the Risk five spec right here. And yeah, this is the table 20.1. And uh, you can see it here. So uh, the table in the book is a little bit different in that um, it diagrams out like registers as boxes from zero on the right half to to 3D, 3D1 on the, the left most. Um, so, you know, it's a register where the most significant bit is on the left and the least significant bit is on the right. Uh, and then within the box, it gives you the name of the register, uh, the, the X name, and then it also gives the ABI name. So it, set, it has this name and then it just has a slash and this name basically. And then to the right of the, the register box, it uh, uh, tells you, you what it is, basically. Uh, and it doesn't tell you whether it's caller or callie saved in this table. Uh, I guess they tell you that in chapter 3 uh, in a different table. But uh, I guess I'd say this table in the, the manual is actually a little better in that it has it all in one. Uh, but yeah, you can see it here that uh, ignore the, the floating point ones. We're just concerned about the, uh, the integer ones, so x0 to x31. And then uh, uh, basically I'll go through what the book says for each. So you have x0, which is also known as 0, and it says it's hardwired to 0. So, you know, these are just going to be the, the same descriptions as here, I take it, uh, these guys, you know. But uh, 
Then you have x1, which is also ra, which is the return address. Then you have x2, which is also sp, which is the stack pointer. Then you have x3, which is also known as gp, or the global pointer. x4, which is also known as tp, or the thread pointer. x5, which is also known as t0, uh, which is a temporary x6, which is also known as t1, which is a temporary, x7, also known as t2, which is a temporary, and then x8 is also known as s0, and it's also known as fp, that is uh, both used as a saved register or as a frame pointer. Uh, x9 is s1, and uh, that's a saved register. Then you have x10, also known as a0, which is a function argument and also used as a return value. x11, uh, also known as a1, which is a function argument or a uh, return value. And then x, x, um, x12 through x17 are all function arguments, so a1 through a7. After that, you have x18 through x27, which are uh, s2 through s11. Uh, Those are all uh, saved registers. After that, you have x28 through x31, which are also known as t3 through t6. Those are temporary registers. And uh, finally, you have uh, the PC, which is not actually a general purpose register. You can't actually access that like the other ones. Uh, but it is a register, so you know, <laughs> just just be aware of that. But um, they drew it separately from the rest of them in here. They don't even have it on the the um, the one in the the manual. But you can see kind of what they've done here is you have this big table and then you see there's a, a break in the table and the PC at the bottom there to indicate that it's, you know, it's not a general purpose register like the rest of them. So those are the registers we're working with for the, the base ISA. Uh, let's see what it says here. What's different? First, there are no byte or half word integer computation operations. The operations are always the full register width. Memory accesses take orders of magnitude more energy than arithmetic operations, so narrow data accesses can save significant energy, uh, but narrow operations do not. ARM32 has the unusual feature of having an option to shift one of the operands in most arithmetic logical or logic operations, which complicates the data path and is rarely needed. Uh, <laughs> RV32i has separate shift instructions. Uh, I think Fabian would probably uh, be up in arms about the is rarely needed bit <laughs> of uh, the the um, the way ARM has uh, shifting like built into every instruction is something that uh, he uses a lot in his work. It seems, and he seems to be in favor of that type of architecture. From what I know, uh, I think he would <laughs> uh, probably dis have have some things to say. Uh, in disagreement with what the book is saying here. Uh, it would be interesting to talk to him and see what he has to say about that sort of thing. Uh, I imagine he would have some uh, interesting opinions on that. But uh, personally, I do not. I do not have any experience with that sort of thing myself. But yeah, that's one thing RISC-V does differently than ARM in, is that uh, it is not one of those kinds of architectures where you're, you're having a shift in every instruction. <laughs> it uh, has separate shift instructions. Uh, we, uh, the book continues on to say, nor does RV32i include multiply and divide. 
they compromise the optional RV32M extension, see chapter 4. Unlike ARM32 and x86-32, the full RISC-V software stack can run without them, which can uh, shrink embedded chips. While not a hardware issue, the MIPS32 assembler may replace a multiply with a sequence uh, shifts and adds to try to improve performance, which may confuse the programmer seeing instructions executed not found in the assembly language program. RV32i also omits rotate instruc instructions and detection of integer arithmetic overflow. Both can be calculated in a few RV32i instructions, and it says C section 2.6. Uh, elaboration, bit twiddling instructions such as rotate, are under consideration by the RISC-V Foundation as part of an optional instruction extension called RV32B, and it says see chapter 11. Elaboration, exclusive R enables a magic trick. Ah, they're gonna go over the uh, exclusive R swap. <laughs> a neat little trick. Another, uh, another trick, um, uh, I've mentioned this on the computer organization and design. Uh, in uh, this chapter, really ties in closely with what we've read on computer organization and design. So I recommend uh, watching some of the the episodes of that. But um, we went over. I don't know where we did this, but we went over all the basic logical operations. Um, let me just see if I can find that. Yeah, so we went over these logical operations. And you can see, because we're doing the RISC-V edition of computer organization and design, they tie it into RISC-V and tell you the, uh, the way it's done in RISC-V as well in terms of actual instructions. So this is tying in pretty closely to that. And one of the things I, I did when I went through that section of the book uh, on the show is I talked about the uses of these instructions, of how these actually get used in practice as a programmer, uh, what these things are useful for. And uh, one of the things I briefly mentioned with exclusive or is that you can do the, the swapping trick where you can use exclusive or to swap without a temporary um, and that's what the RISC-V reader is about to uh, go into detail about of how exactly you do that. And uh, I, I looked it up after that episode because I was curious to refresh myself on it. And uh, it's basically, it's kind of like a fundamental property of the fact that the operations are reversible. So I can derive it for you. And it doesn't even need to be done with exclusive or you could do it with stuff like addition as well or subtraction or, you know, whatever. It actually kind of fall, this trick kind of falls out of the algebra of these being uh, reversible operations. And um, I'll show you what I mean in a second here. But uh, another thing that I was that I remembered when I was looking that up again is I saw it on Wikipedia again that uh, another thing you can do with uh, exclusive or that's kind of interesting is a linked list, uh, an exclusive or linked list where uh, basically it it uses the same fundamental trick of the fact that the operations are reversible, where. Uh, you can actually uh, store the exclusive or of t of the two pointers of the the previous and the next pointer uh, for a linked list, and then if you if you are iterating the list in one direction, you know the previous and you know the current. Uh, <laughs> you can use that algebra to recover the pointer for the next element. And uh, similarly, uh, you can use it going the other direction. If you know what the, the previous was, uh, you know, you can get the, the next going the other, other direction. Uh,
So yeah, let me just uh, whiteboard out kind of what I'm talking about so you can see uh, a little bit of, of well, like first I'll, I'll show you how this is done uh, for a, a swap. So basically the concept is what we want to do is we have two values, A and B, and we want to do a swap such that, uh, you know, let's say A equals uh, 42, uh, B equals, uh, what should be B? How about just some, uh, what's a good number? 13, it's Halloween, right? You know, I mean, not not right now, but it's October. It's leading up to Halloween. Let's do, you know, 13. And that's kind of seen as like a unlucky number, you know, 13th floor and uh, Friday the 13th and that sort of thing. So we've got, uh, you know, 42 and 13 here. And what we want to do is we want to swap A and B such that, you know, after the swap, A equals 13, B equals 42. So how do you do how do you do this step right here? How do you do how do you do the swap? Well, you would think naively that you would have to use a temporary, right? You would have to say, you know, t some temporary equals a a equals b b equals t, right? You'd think you would need a a middleman to, to temporarily hold one of the values when you're doing the swap, right? Because it's kind of a juggling act that you're doing here. Uh, and uh, <laughs> you need uh, something to hold the thing you throw up in the air when you're, you know, when you're juggling, them, juggling the values around, right? But uh, it doesn't actually, you don't actually need this temporary here because uh, of uh, a little algebraic trick. So the idea here is that uh, if you do uh, A and, uh, like I say, this can be done with any uh, reversible operation. So let me start by showing you with addition because that's more intuitive. That's, you know, we've, we've worked with addition all our lives. Uh, we learned it in grade school, right? Uh, so this should be maybe more comfortable to you than starting with an exclusive R, but the concept is the same. And exclusive R is basically just addition for, you know, a single bit. <laughs> yeah, ignoring the carry that it is like exactly addition, right? And uh, the algebraic properties hold for it as well. And that's what's going to be important here is, you know, if we say, a plus B, right, uh, you know, let's say that uh, C equals A plus B, right? Now, if I say, uh, you know, I want to recover A and I want to recover B, right? So. If I say, uh, if C is equal to A plus B, then if I subtract B from both sides, for example, then C minus B gives you A, right? And similarly, if I subtract A, then, you know, C minus A recovers B, right? So if you know one of them, the operation is reversible, right? So here's the trick, right? If you say A equals A plus B, you still know B, right? So now what you have is A plus B and you have B, right? And so 
uh, from here, you can say, well, if I subtract b from a plus b, I can recover a, right? So I still know what a is, and I still know what b is, right? But I've currently got a plus b and b, right? So now uh, the next step we're going to do is, uh, and I haven't thought about this ahead of time, but uh, I think it's, uh, let me see here, if you do, if you do like b equals a minus b, right, because a is a plus b, right? So a minus b is a plus b minus b, or a. So now what you have is you have a equal to a plus b. b is equal to, or sorry, let me, b is equal to a, right? So we've got a into the, the correct position now. And if you do a plus b minus a, you're going to get back b, right? So now you say a equals a minus b, right? So that's a plus b minus a, the original a, uh, and that's going to give you b, right? So, so a equals a plus b b equals a minus b, a equals a minus b. And that will swap a and b, uh, right? So to, uh, to make it a little bit clearer, you can think of it if we call, uh, if we call a plus b c, then what you do is you say you're saying that uh, c equals a plus b, and then you're saying b equals uh, c minus b, a equals uh, and then it's going to be uh, just uh, C minus minus B again. Uh, maybe I should give this a different name to make that clearer. Uh, so let's say D is equal to A plus B or you know C minus B. So this is D, right? Then uh, what you're doing here is C minus D. Right, a equals c minus d. So th you know this is what it is if we separate out the variables. But the fact is that this variable and this variable aren't needed. Uh, you can overwrite a and you can overwrite b right here, right? And it works out because the operations, like I say, are reversible. We always have the sum of the two numbers and one of the other numbers. And as long as we have one of the numbers and the sum, we can recover the other number that made up the sum, right? Because algebra, that's just, you know, the math of it. That, you know, if you have a sum of two numbers and you have one of the numbers, then you can subtract it to recover uh, what the, the number you don't know was, right? That's what uh, I'm talking about when I say the operation is reversible. Uh, if you know what one of the inputs was, you can recover uh, what the uh, other input was by doing the the, re the reverse operation, which in this case uh, is subtraction. Uh, but with exclusive R, uh, you can do this same trick with exclusive or is the idea, right? Uh, you can do this for any any operation that's reversible like this, and exclusive or is reversible like this, and uh, 
So if I just write out the truth table for exclusive R to remind you, you know, we have 0 and 0, 0 and 1, 1 and 0, 1 and 1. These are our inputs. And then our output is 0, 1, 1, 0, like this, right? Only if one of the inputs is on is the output on, right? Uh, that's what an exclusive OR is. And so, you know, if we think about just a, you know, a one bit exclusive OR, what does that do and how do we reverse it? Is it reversible, right? And let's just do the math and see, right? So if you do zero exclusive OR with zero, right? that equals zero. If we do the exclusive R of zero and one, that gives you one. And again, this is just, you know, the truth table, right? Right, so these are our, our sums, basically. You know, this is like the plus here is the exclusive R here. And so these are the different possible results we have. Now, if we have <coughs> one of the inputs, like when we do A equals A plus B, here we're gonna say A equals A exclusive R B. So what we're gonna have as the result is A exclusive R B in A, and in B we're still gonna have B. Right. So uh, what what we're asking is if we have this value and this value, can we recover this value? Right. So let's just look at those pairs. We have zero. So we're going to write this pair, or you know these numbers, and then we're going to write these numbers. So let me just do that. And then finally we write these numbers. Right. So this is our input. This is our output. And then uh, like this, this column here is uh, the the exclusive R of A and B. This column here is just B, right? And this column here is A. And we're asking if we build that truth table, what is the operation that takes us from these inputs to this output? Is there uh, an operation that can do that? And if you look at the table, you see that there is. It's an exclusive R, right? Because we have zero and zero gives you zero. 1 and 1 gives you 0. It, only if one of the inputs is 1 do you get a 1. Right? This is an exclusive R. So to do the inverse of an exclusive R, you just do an exclusive R. Right? <laughs> so what that means is you can do this, uh, you know, literally like this. Right? You can do A equals A exclusive R B. B equals uh, a exclusive or B and then a equals a exclusive or B is that right I f think that should be right because uh, right exclusive or is the inverse of exclusive or and the pattern was like this right a a B B a B a a B a a B B a B a a B we do an operation we do the inverse and then again, this is equivalent to the inverse. I think that should be right. Uh, we'll double check it, but uh, I feel like that should be right. Yeah. 
because like I say, this is the algebra for if we're doing it with addition. So I feel like that should translate to exclusive R because we see that it's reversible like this, right? So let's just test it. We're going to say we have 0, 1, 1, 0. We're just going to do a nibble, right? And then 1, 1, 0, 0. These are our two values. This is A, this is B. And we're hoping to get uh, a result where A is 1, 1, 0, 0. B is 0, 1, 1, 0. And what I've done here is I've just picked two numbers where uh, we have a case where they overlap. We have a case where, you know, like here is a case where, you know, they're both zero. Here's a case where you have some ones that are overlapping. Here's a case and here's a case where you have a one that is, you know, paired up with a zero, right? So we're getting good kind of test coverage, if you will, with these two uh, numbers. That's the, the idea of why I picked these numbers, right? And then, uh, you know, if we just do the exclusive or of A and B, we're, what we're going to get is, uh, you know, 0 exclusive or 0, which is just 0. 1 and 0 gives you 1. And 1 and 1 gives you 0. And then 0 and 1 gives you 1, right? So A becomes 1, 0, 1, 0, and B is still 1, 1, 0, 0, right? Now we do B equals A exclusive or uh, B. So we're taking this number and this number, and because of the reversibility property we just saw, we expect to uh, get back to, you know, recover A from this operation. So this is going to give you 0, this is going to give you 1, this gives you 1, and uh, this gives you 0. So that's what A was originally. So now B equals this, and so now we take uh, A, which is still this number, and then uh, we exclusive R with this number, which is what A originally was. So 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Like I say, we do the exclusive R again, and you get 0, 0, 1, 1. And so A equals, and so yeah, it looks like that's working, right? That gave us the expected output. A is 1, 1, 0, 0, B is 0, 1, 1, 0. So algebra seems to have told us the truth, right? We did the math. We saw that this is reversible. We saw how you can use the property of reversibility to uh, do a swap without um, using a temporary. And then we just applied that pattern using a different reversible operation. And it looks like it works, right? So that's the, the magic trick that the book is going to be talking about how you swap two values without a temporary using an exclusive or. And like I say, we, uh, because I, I showed you how you derive such a thing, it shouldn't be magic to you anymore, right? It's purely algebra, right? It just follows from the math. It's just a, a clever trick that follows from the math. The fact that you can reverse the operation. If you have the if you have a sum of two numbers and one of the inputs, you can get back the other input, right? That property holds true for exclusive or, so you can do this little trick here. That's all there is to it, right? So let's see what the book has to say, and then I'll show you how you can use this to do linked lists as well. So, exclusive or enables a magic trick. You can exchange two values without using an intermediate register, exclamation point. This code exchanges the values of x1 and x2. We leave the proof to the reader. I think I've done a decent job of that. Uh, maybe not what you would consider a, a rigorous mathematical proof, but uh, <laughs> 
I've kind of shown you the intuition, the mathematical intuition of why it works, of how the the mathematical properties of the you know the algebra make this work, and how it's not just exclusive or it's any reversible operation, basically. And it just so happens that exclusive or is reversible. That's why this trick works. So, uh, hint: exclusive or is commutative. A exclusive R B equals B exclusive R A. Associative, A exclusive R B in parentheses and then exclusive R C is equal to A exclusive R parentheses B exclusive R C. Uh, is its own inverse A exclusive R A equals zero and has an identity A exclusive R zero equals A. Right, so there they give you all the the mathematical properties that enable what I'm talking about. Right, that's the the algebraic rules that exclusive R satisfies, and using those algebraic rules, you can algebraically prove that you can do this sort of thing. Right, and uh, I showed you that much more <laughs> informally. So uh, it says exclusive R, x1, x1, x2, and then the next instruction is exclusive R, x2, x1, x2, and then the final instruction is exclusive R, x1, x1, x2. So yeah, that is exactly what I wrote here. Uh, we correctly did the little trick, uh, but of course they're doing it in RISC-V assembly, so but you know same thing uh, however fascinating risk fives ample regis register set us usually lets compilers find a scratch register so it rarely uses the exclusive or swap so yeah uh, that's all there is to say about that uh, but uh, like i say i want to point out that this enables uh, one other trick, which is um, linked lists. Um, and so the idea is uh, literally just based on this concept of the of the XR swap, which is what this is called, right? Uh, using this trick, the idea is rather than just using this to swap two numbers, uh, we can use this to uh, store a, instead of, you know, like a linked list is basically just a structure where you have some, you know, like, uh, you know, you can say like type def struct in C. And then, you know, you have like, uh, and then let's call this, you know, node. And then we have a void pointer for uh, the uh, data, uh, or I guess datum, you know, the element that uh, this member of the, the list is uh, holding. And then, uh, you know, we have a struct node pointer next right uh, and so we you know each each node has a pointer to another node that's a point you know the next pointer in the in the the list right and so the idea here is uh, well you know another thing you can do is you can have a doubly length linked list where you don't just store the pointer to the next element you also store the pointer to the previous element right so then you need two pointers to do a doubly linked list and I believe the concept here is instead of storing a next pointer and a previous pointer you store the exclusive or of the next pointer and the previous pointer and then <laughs> by doing an exclusive or with the one that you know you can recover the other one, right? So when you're iterating over the elements of the list, uh, what you do is you keep track of where you came from, right? And then you just take the current 
uh, the current uh, exclusive or of pointers and your previous pointer, the pointer of the previous element, and you do the exclusive or, and that gives you the pointer to the next element. But you can do that in both directions, right? So it enables you to have a doubly linked list, but you only use a single pointer uh, per element, right? So uh, just to be a little bit more explicit, The idea is, I've showed you the structure for a singly linked list. Uh, let's have another struct here, and I'm not going to bother type defing this time, uh, <laughs> but uh, we're going to have a struct uh, called node again, and uh, we're not going to worry about the data that it is actually being stored in the linked list. That's what makes the linked list useful, but <laughs> we only care about the property of how we're enabling you to traverse the list, right? And that's the pointers to that linked the that link the list together, right? That's what makes the linked list a linked list, right? So we have a you know a node pointer, and you know, technically you need struct in front of this name, but don't worry about the details. You know, maybe you're using C or something. Uh, <laughs> so you have a node pointer, and uh, it's the previous, and then you have a node pointer, and it's the next, right? And so if you have an element like the first element of a list, then given that, you can traverse the list by following the chain of next pointers. But if you have the last element of the list, you can traverse the list backwards following the previous pointers, right? So, uh, you know, the idea is basically. In a singly linked list, what you have is you have some pointer that lets you jump right between elements, and then this would just be, you know, uh, null at the end, right? But the pointer lets you jump forward, so you can only you know, given some element, usually you would store the beginning of it, but maybe you have some element in the middle for some reason, it doesn't matter. The point is, given some place in the list that you have, you can always look at the next element by dereferencing the pointer in the structure to jump to the next element in the list. And you can repeatedly do this to iterate through the entire list by jumping through the pointers, right? Uh, that's how that works, but it's only one direction. You can't go backwards this way. So a doubly linked list is just the concept that you know you store an extra pointer, and then that pointer jumps to the previous element, right? And so you do the same trick, going the opposite direction, right? And then this one, null, right? That's the idea of a doubly linked list. It's a really simple concept. Uh, and the, the, the trick we're talking about here is you can use this fact that we just saw to do this, the exclusive or swap to do a doubly linked list with a single, uh, a single pointer, but it's not really a pointer. <laughs> so what you do is, again, you know, you have a struct node. And then instead of two node pointers, what you're going to have is, uh, and it's not really a pointer anymore. <laughs> so uh, you know, let's just uh, uh, let's just call it a you know like a size t or something. And it's a uh, you know I don't know what you what a good name for it would be is. Uh, let's just say iter, you know. And uh, the idea here is what you do is in uh, when you do this, 
when you create a new node, instead of uh, you know allocating a node and then setting the the next pointer and the previous pointer, what you do is you set iter to be you know my node dot iter equals cast to size t, and then you do. Um, and I don't know if you can exclusive or pointers without first casting them. Let's just be safe and cast them both. So we're going to cast, um, you know, the previous node. And so assuming we have a previous node, then we need to have that on hand, right? And then we do that. And then uh, because the next pointer would be, you know, assuming this is the latest element, then you'd be just, you know, exclusive oring with null. But then when you add in a new element, you know, you take this value and you'd exclusive or it with the uh, the new, you know, the address of the new element. And similarly, if you are doing the first element of the list, then uh, the previous node is going to be null. And because you don't have a next, uh, you know, it would just be null. You know, the first element is just null exclusive or with null, which of course is just zero. Uh, but then when you add a new element, you say, so like, you'd say like, you know, your first element of your list you allocate, right? So say like, uh, you know, size of node, right? You're going to allocate however many bytes you need for the node. And uh, you're going to say like, right, allocate your node. Uh, and then you say like, uh, you know, or I guess just zero because we're storing it as a size t not that those details matter but you know and then uh, <laughs> when you do a new node that you're going to append to this what you're doing is uh you say basically a dot iter equals uh or you know zor equals exclusive or equals the result of allocating a new node. And then uh, you know to get to the new node, uh, you can just cast it to a pointer, right? Because you don't need to uh, get rid of the previous, but now, so if I go to the next element, and let's say we have, you know, we've constructed three elements in this way, right? So I'm going to put it in the middle, <laughs> the element in the middle to indicate that it's the, the you know, the exclusive R of the previous and the next. So here, previous is null, right? So when we allocate a new, uh, a new um, member, we're just storing the pointer of this member to here, right? And then when we want to jump from here to here, right, we're just casting this to a pointer and dereferencing it. But now this one, we're going to allocate a new... Uh, so the first thing we put in, in this slot right here is we put the... Uh, the value of the previous, right? So the address of this element right here gets put in here. And then once we allocate this guy, we exclusive or the address of this with what was already here, right? 
so this thing is basically holding the pointer to both of these and uh, if you want to go this way what you do is you take this exclusive ord with the address of this one so you need to know where the previous one was which you do if you're iterating this way right you just keep track of what your previous uh, previous address of the previous element was and then you say okay exclusive var you know previous uh, current right cast that to a pointer and dereference it and it, it'll take you to this guy and then similarly if you're going this way then you just take you know next exclusive ord with the current one right so uh you know the the next pointer of of this structure is uh in this case it's null because we're at the the end of the uh the end of the the list here but uh uh uh, it would be the previous elements, right? So if we add another element here, right, then uh, if you're on this guy and you're iterating this way, you, you store where you were last time. So again, you're storing this guy. And this is the, you know, you can think of it if this was a doubly linked list, uh, the next pointer of this structure would point to this guy here, right? So I'm saying, you know, store this guy's address and then exclusive or it with the value you stored in here and that'll give you the previous address so that lets you jump back this way right so you can it, it works like a doubly linked list but you're only storing you know i guess you could call it current that's kind of what i'm calling it up here right uh but it's really the sum of the previous and the next uh, and it, again, because it, it works on the principle of this reversibility of operations, the same way the swap does, uh, it doesn't have to be done with exclusive or. You can do this with addition and subtraction too, right? Same principle works. Uh, but that's a way you can, uh, you can do a doubly linked list without storing two pointers. So that's one other trick you can do using this property and again you can find this stuff on Wikipedia so if you just search like uh, exclusive or swap you'll see they have the exclusive or swap algorithm explained in great detail uh, and you can see see also exclusive or linked list and this is what I'm talking about here you can see that for each element they do the uh, exclusive R of the previous and the next rather than having next pointers and previous pointers you have the, these exclusive or kind of in the middle guys that can go both directions. So that's one example of kind of a use for exclusive or that you can do. Although, uh, you know, these kinds of techniques do have their drawbacks. Uh, particularly, it can be like for uh, debugging, it can be an issue and like they say, uh, ex the exclusive R technique for Risk Five isn't necessarily that useful because um, you don't uh, <laughs> uh, you don't uh, you have a lot of registers to begin with, right? You've you've got thirty two general purpose registers, thirty one of which you know one of them is the zero register, but the other thirty one are general purpose registries. You've got a lot of registries to work with generally. You don't really need to be <laughs> saving the temporary register. And uh, Wikipedia says that, you know, can, compilers can often opt optimize away the temporary variable uh, without having to rely on tricks like this anyway, right? 
and it says on modern modern architectures this technique can be slower than ju just using a temporary right so there are reasons to not do this i'm not saying this is a trick you want to start using all over the place just because you can <laughs> But uh, it's a it's a neat thing to to be aware of, right? And uh, you know there are similar caveats to uh, you know the um, the linked list thing here. Uh, so like they say, general purpose debugging tools can't follow the chain, which makes debugging more difficult. Uh, they complain about code complexity personally i wouldn't consider that to actually be a problem uh i don't think it is that uh <laughs> complicated or whatever you know um i don't think it you know needlessly obfuscates the code you know i think it's you know especially if you document what you're doing you know uh but anyway uh, they also mentioned that, you know, garbage collectors are not going to play nice with this sort of thing. Uh, it points out that not all languages support converting between pointers and integers. Like you saw in my example, I was saying, you know, let's store it as a, a size T, uh, which is an integer. Um, and they're saying, you know, not every language will let you, you know, play fast and loose between pointers and integers like you can in C. Uh, and they also point out that this technique uh, does not provide some of the important advantages of doubly linked lists, such as the ability to delete a node from the list knowing only its address, or the ability to insert a new node before or after an existing node when knowing only the address of the existing node, right? So there are drawbacks too, you know, uh, like I say, again, it doesn't it doesn't uh, necessarily it's not necessarily a thing you should break out and use all the time uh, but it's a, a nice trick to know that uh, this is something you can do with exclusive or uh, and they also point out here that like I said you can do this with other reversible operations so of course you can do this with addition you can do this with subtraction you know the same principle as with the you know same exact concept as how I showed you that uh, this trick of swapping uh, is any reversible operation. And I first showed it using addition, right? Uh, this is an addition swap uh, that I showed right here. And, you know, it's the same principle as the exclusive or swap. Same exact thing applies with the linked list because it's the same concept. That's uh, all there is to be said about that. So, if you didn't know about those, now you know. There's a few interesting tricks you can do with exclusive or. Okay. Let's see. How much is there left for this chapter? It would be nice to get through section two. I don't know if we're actually going to get through the whole section. What time is it? Mm. Let's go through... Let's go through 2.5. And then we'll uh, maybe call it there. RV32i loads and stores. As well as providing loads and stores of 32-bit words, uh, load word and store word or LW and SW, uh, figure 2.1 shows that RV32i has loads for signed and unsigned bytes and half words, LB, LBU, LH, LHU, and stores for bytes and half words, SB and SH. Signed bytes and half words are sign extended to 32 bits and written to the destination registers. This widening of narrow data allows subsequent integer computation instructions to operate correctly on all 32 bits, even if the natural data types uh, are narrower. 
unsigned bytes and half words useful for text and unsigned integers are zero extended to 32 bits before being written to the destination register. The only addressing mode for loads and stores is adding a sign extended 12 bit immediate to a register called a uh, displacement addressing mode in x86-32. Uh, what's different? RV32i omitted the sophisticated addressing modes of ARM32 and x86-32. Alas, all ARM32 addressing modes aren't available for all data types. But uh, RV32i addressing does not discriminate against any data type. RISC-V can imitate some x86 addressing modes. For example, setting the immediate field to zero has the same effect as the register indirect addressing mode. Unlike x86-32, RISC-V has no special stack instructions. By using one of the 31 registers as the stack pointer, the standard, uh, and it says C figure 2.4, the standard addressing mode gets most of the benefits of push and pop instructions without the added ISA complexity. Unlike MIPS32, RISC-V rejected delayed load. Similar in spirit to delayed branches, MIPS32 redefined the load so the data is unavailable until two instructions later. Uh, when it would show up in a five-stage pipeline. Whatever benefit it had evaporated for the longer pipelines that came later. This is something uh, Fabian, again, he's done some videos on computer architecture, and this is one of the things he talked about, that uh, this is something that they did in MIPS. I remember him specifically discussing this, that it's, they did this, and then the idea <laughs> kind of, you know, didn't didn't make any sense once you went to a bigger pipeline, right? It made sense when they were doing that five stage pipeline, but it didn't make sense when you go <laughs> to a bigger pipeline, and so you know it was kind of a, a bad design decision. Uh, and I'll refer you to his videos. I highly recommend. Uh, I don't think. I have them on here on the useful links because they're not specifically RISC-V related. They're just kind of computer architecture in general. But let me see. Uh, I don't know how easy he is to find. Yeah, pretty easy to find if you just search him on uh, Twitter or I mean uh, YouTube. Uh, you'll see he has these videos here, uh, rambling talk about CPU microarchitecture stuff, more CPU microarchitecture stuff, uh, superscalar pipes, stalls, uh, interrupts and exceptions. This one is about SRAM arrays, caches. This one's about microcode. Uh, and I think the one I'm thinking of is this one or this one probably this one because it talks about superscalar pipes and stalls and stuff i'm guessing it's that one but i don't know for sure and this isn't like a proper series like bitwise or handmade hero or what i do and it's not annotated or anything like that it would be nice if it was because it's great information but uh i don't know if he has any interest in having someone like miblo annotate these but uh, they're great videos. I highly recommend you watch this whole series of uh, four videos that he's done. Um, and he he did, I know for sure, he discussed what the, the book is talking about here. I distinctly remember that. Uh, so yeah, I, I highly recommend checking those videos out. That's my uh, recommendation for the day for, you know, <laughs> Uh, additional viewing if you are so inclined but those are those are much more kind of advanced videos they're kind of like a just a, a very high level whirlwind overview of some very advanced uh, you know architecture you know computer architecture uh, kind of 
design considerations. Uh, and so, you know, I wouldn't say I necessarily was able to follow a high percentage of what he talked about. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things where even if you're not at the the level of understanding to be able to follow everything well, it's one of those things where you can kind of go into the, the, the sponge mode of learning where you just surround yourself with something and, you know, you have all this information blasted at you and it's not like a lot of it is going to stick, but just by having been exposed to it, then as you go and continue to learn in the subject area, like today when we're reading this, you know, it sparked that memory in my mind like, oh, you know, what they're talking about here, I remember Fabian discussed that in more detail on his series. I remember, you know, some aspects of that. And then it's like, hmm, you know, maybe it would be interesting to go and uh, go and watch that, you know, uh, see what he had to say about that sort of thing. So yeah, I wish it was annotated <laughs> because then I could go back and rewatch just the relevant part, you know. Uh, I'd, I'd really like to do that. But like I say, those videos aren't annotated, so it's not so easy to just jump to the the relevant section like you can with my series but uh there's lots of great information in those nonetheless anyway uh let's keep reading here while arm 32 and mips 32 require data to be aligned naturally to data sized boundaries in memory risk 5 does not misaligned accesses are sometimes required when parting legacy code uh, one option is to disallow misaligned accesses in the base ISA and then provide some separate instructions uh, support for misaligned accesses, such as load word left and load word right of MIPS32. This option would complicate register access, however, since LWL and LWR require writing pieces of registers instead of uh, simply full registers. Requiring instead that the regular loads and stores support misaligned accesses simplified the overall design. Uh, and this is, uh, this is um, something that, uh, again, another recommendation to check out. Um, <laughs> I thought there was going to only be, be one uh, series recommendation, but there's going to be two because this and gets into another thing, um, the LM ARV1 series by Robert uh, Baruch, 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 I don't know how you say his name, as usual, but uh, he has this nice series here, and uh, part five specifically uh, goes over this stuff that they're talking about here, about how uh, Risk Five supports misaligned uh, memory accesses, uh, this part five of his video was all about, um, you know, dealing with memory accesses, the fact that, you know, it's a, you know, byte oriented addressing and, um, you know, uh, going through the kind of designing circuitry to handle misaligned accesses and stuff like that. Uh, you know, he kind of dives into that stuff in this video. And it's a very good watch, so I highly recommend that as well. But again, uh, he doesn't have annotations uh, like we do here. But anyway, to continue here, um, uh, we have an elaboration uh, about endianness. Uh, Risk Five shows little endian byte ordering because it is dominant commercially. All x86-32 systems and Apple iOS, Google Android OS, and Microsoft Windows for ARM are all little endian. Since the endian order matters only when accessing the identical data both as a word and as bytes, endianness affects few programmers. Uh, and yeah, endianness is something that doesn't come up that often, but it does now and then. Uh, one area where it typically comes up is networking. Because uh, with networking, they have network byte order, which is big endian. So <laughs> network traffic is usually done big endian, but your your systems are usually 
little end again. So <laughs> you need to do a conversion there. And that's just kind of a historical accident, I'd say, that, you know, at the time, uh, you know, both choices are equally valid, whether you're little Indian or big Indian, you know, it's just a, a matter of choosing and sticking to a convention. And, you know, some people would go with one convention, some people would go with another. It just kind of wound up that networking conventions ended up going with big Indian, whereas, you know, uh, systems ended up typically standardizing on little Indian. <laughs> so it's just kind of a, yeah, a historical accident, I'd say, that things ended up that way. And uh, that's one area where you'll typically encounter that. But uh, you usually don't need to worry about NDNS too much in your your day-to-day -day programming, but it's something to be uh, aware of. Uh, another thing I'll say about NDN NDNS here, uh, I've mentioned this on like computer organization and design and stuff, and uh, I think I mentioned it in pcalc maybe because we dealt with NDNS there uh, in that code base. Um, uh, but uh, a little fun fact for you is that uh, the term NDN actually comes from Gulliver's uh, Travels. Uh, uh, what was it? The uh, Lilliput or whatever it was called, the uh, place in in uh, Gulliver's Travels. Uh, there were the you know like it was uh, it was this you know uh, kind of satire of um, you know this very big political rift, this divide between these people of you know dealing with uh, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was the little end or the big end of something, you know, some very trivial trivial thing, and it's what everybody was you know going to war over. Um, Let's look it up. Gulliver's Travels. Yeah, uh, the voyage to Lilliput. Uh, so in this story, this is a you know a classic piece of literature. Uh, so he washes ashore after a shipwreck, and. Uh, he finds himself prisoner to this race of tiny little people, less than six inches tall, who are inhabitants of this island called uh, Lilliput. Uh, so where's the bit about... Uh... Yeah, it's about uh, which end of the egg you crack. That's what I thought. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, uh, the Lilliputans... And I don't, again, I don't know pronunciations, but they reveal themselves uh, to be a people who put great emphasis on trivial matters. For example, which end of an egg a person craps, cracks sorry, <laughs> becomes uh, the basis of a deep political rift within that nation. Uh, they are a people who revel in displays of authority and performance of, of power, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so basically... Uh, there were the group of people who uh, consider that you ought to crack an egg uh, by the big end and the people who think you ought to crack an egg by the little end and essentially you know it was this really deep political rift and they were like going to war over this right and so the people who felt you should crack it by the little end were the little Indians and the people who thought you should crack it by the big end were the big Indians and that's kind of where this terminology comes from. Uh, in computer science, it's a terminology for uh, <laughs> which end comes first in in the number. You know, do you do the 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 low end? Is it from low to high, or is it from high to low? You know, which way is a is a number stored? Uh, like uh, by byte, do you put the low bytes first or the high bytes first? And so if you put the high bytes first, you're big Indian, and if you do the low bytes first, you're, low, you're little Indian, right? Uh, the terminology is uh, a reference to uh, Gulliver's Travels. So there's just a little uh, fun bit of trivia for you about uh, Indianness and, and where that terminology comes from. Uh, so that's the end of 2.5. The next section will be 2.6. 
uh, RB32i conditional branch. But uh, I think we'll leave that for the uh, next episode. So uh, thank you everyone who tuned in today. Actually, you know, before I end it, I just want to, you know, show you a little bit about NDNS in practice in a, in a code base. Because like I said, we, we dealt with NDNS um, in the pcalc code base. So I can show you. Oh, uh, hello, Krish, and uh, thank you for tuning in. But no worries, uh, you'll be able to catch it on YouTube. It'll go public in one week, or uh, it'll also be available tomorrow on early access. But uh, that's only for people who uh, subscribe on Patreon. So, uh, but either way, you'll be able to <laughs> see the episode eventually. Also, you can just see it immediately if you look on Twitch. Um, if you look at the, the videos tab, so if I go to my Twitch, So on Twitch, you can always watch a recording. If you go to the videos tab here, uh, this video will end up immediately on the, uh, the videos tab here. Um, you can see it's, uh, it's already here and uh, you'll be able to watch the whole thing there. But like I say, it'll be up on YouTube uh, by tomorrow for early access. And then uh, that'll be annotated pretty quickly by Miblo as well. He usually gets those annotated pretty fast. And then there's an early access episode guide where you can see the annotated version. And that's a very nice thing. And then, like I say, it goes uh, public on YouTube after a week. Uh, and then that's available on the, the normal episode guide as well with annotations. But uh, yeah, thank you for tuning in. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to catch more live in the future. So uh, what I want to show before I end this episode is just this uh, PCAL code base where we uh, deal with... Um... Oh, yeah, I saw you had this question on YouTube, but I haven't gotten around to replying on YouTube yet. I'll just uh, <laughs> reply now since you're asking here. Uh, Krish asks, I have a question for you. Is Hamming distance implemented in RISC-V ISA and the compiler for more energy slash code efficiency? And uh, my answer is simply, I don't know if Hamming distance has anything uh, like I'm, I assume you're talking about uh, for the design of the ISA itself, the encoding of um, how they lay out the the bits, basically, uh, if that's what you're referring to for the Hamming distance to like efficiently, you know, lay things out. Uh, I know there's a lot of you know things are really um, they put a lot of thought into the the way the instructions are encoded, and um, yeah, I don't know for sure whether or not uh, Hamming distance specifically was considered but I would not be surprised at all. <laughs> um, uh, that would be a better question to ask uh, the actual creators of RISC-V, uh, uh, Krista, um, Andrew, and Yunsup. Uh, you could probably ask them on the Sci-Fi forums, and I'd imagine they or someone else would answer. Another thing would be if you could find, like, research papers about RISC-V that they've done. They might mention that sort of thing in there. But uh, uh, from what I've read, I, I don't believe I've seen anything specifically mentioned about uh, Hamming distance with regards to how they designed things. Yeah, so uh, Chris says to make the minimum bit flips and thus uh, to save switching losses. Yeah. Um, I would I would imagine it probably was 
uh, considered in the design, but like I say, I don't know for sure. So I, I can't give you a definitive answer on that. But um, I guess all I can say about that is I wouldn't be surprised if it was one of the considerations in how they designed it. Because uh, <laughs> I know they did put a lot of uh, thought into the design. Uh, it is very intelligently designed. So I would I would expect some sort like I would expect they, you know, it at least crossed their mind. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, probably the best place to ask would be the sci-fi forums. Uh, I feel like you'd probably get a better answer there because uh, the creators of Risk Five are all working at Sci Five, so <laughs> that's kind of the the place to go. Uh, but yeah, that's all I can really tell you. I I have not encountered anything uh, specifically talking about Hamming distance with regards to the design. Now about um, about endianness, uh, you'll see in my X11 backend here where I encountered it personally with this piece of software is, uh, let's see here. Yeah, so when you do the XAuth for uh, connecting to the X11 server, if you're doing a X11 application for Linux, so a, you know, a windowed application, um, a graphical application, uh, unless you're using something like Wayland, then you're probably using X11 and you need to, your application needs to talk to the X11 server. And uh, part of that is doing the XAuth uh, process. And uh, so you need to parse this uh, information that they give you back. And um, there are shorts that it gives you and you need to actually byte swap them because they're, uh, they're big endian rather than little endian. So you see what I do here is uh, I have an, an iterator that I pass in and uh, I cast it to a U16 pointer to grab uh, you know a short out of it and then dereference it to to get the short. But now this the short is in the wrong byte order because it's you know stored big endian instead of little endian. So uh, what I do is I actually, you know, I shift the bottom eight bits up into the top eight bits of a, of a short, and I shift uh, the high bits into the, the bottom low eight bits, and then I or them together, right? So that swaps the, the, the bytes, and then I return that. So that's how I'm, I'm you know, correcting the end this. Of a, of a short in this program. That's uh, one example of where I've encountered, you know, needing to, to mess with endianness. And you can see in the code where that actually gets used. So uh, what happens here is um, basically the way it works with X11 is you, you open a socket to the X11 server to talk to it. And then, um, so, you know, here you can see you open the socket and, you know, you connect to it. And then um, you open this X authority file, which has the information for authenticating with the server using MIT Magic Cookie 1 authentication, which is what they call it. And so what you have to do is you've got to, you know, read that into memory. And then um, you need to just iterate over the stuff in the file and parse it into a structure. And then uh, you need to uh, basically just send that to the uh, server. So you can see I do a write V to send all this stuff to the server. and. Uh, yeah, wait, you you need to parse out the family, the host address length, the host address, the display length, the display, the auth name length, the auth name, the data length, the data. And then you also need to give it uh, 
a connection request, some information about uh, what you're trying to do here. So you say uh, L um, for little endian, and then major is 11 because it's x11, and uh, you tell it the the information about the type of authorization that you're doing. And like I say, this code here is doing MIT Magic Cookie One authentication. Um, and yeah, you just write all that information to the socket and then you read back the response. And that's how you do a connection to an X11 server. Like that's what it's actually, what's actually happening under the hood. I've just implemented it directly into the, the code here. And uh, yeah, that's one example where the XAuth file, which is a little file on disk, um, like if you look on a, on a Linux system, if you just look in your home directory, so if I do ls dash a, you'll see that uh, there's a .x authority file. Uh, this is the xauth file, right? This is provided by your X11 setup, basically, for uh, applications to connect to the X11 server. They need to parse the information in this file and then send it to the server to connect to it, right? And that's how you authenticate with the server. And so, you know, if you look at See, you can see it's just uh, kind of garbage mostly in here, but uh, you can see there is your uh, your host name there, and this is the authentication name, MIT Magic Cookie One. Uh, so that's the authentication protocol that's in this file, and then like I say, that's your host name right there, and then the rest of it is just like a bunch of shorts that are in uh, Big Endian. And that's why you need to byte swap them. So yeah, that's one practical example of where NGNS uh, comes into play. So with that, uh, I will end the episode there. So thank you everyone for tuning in. And thank you everyone who watches on the YouTube archive, which is available at risky.tv. And you can follow me at HMN underscore risky on Twitter to get updates about the series. And thank you also to everyone who supports me on Patreon, which is available at uh, patreon.risky.tv. I don't have any new shout outs to give today, but you know, I just want to say that it really makes what I do possible. And uh, kind of tying into what uh, Krish was wondering here, or not really wondering, but uh, he mentioned he missed this episode. Uh, like I say, with Patreon, uh, one of the, the perks of supporting me on Patreon is that you do get early access to the videos when they go up on YouTube rather than watching the VODs on Twitch. And uh, the the one thing that's nice about that too is that you get early access to uh, the episode guide, uh, the annotations that Mibla does. Uh, that's one thing that you uh, otherwise would not get access to until uh, one week after videos go live. So. That's just one little perk if for people who want to support me on Patreon. Not that you have to support, <laughs> not that anyone has to support me on Patreon. Uh, I totally understand when people, you know, are not uh, able to or willing to support. That's totally understandable. But you know, I just want to point out that that is uh, one way to uh, get early access to my content. So with that said, uh, I'll see you guys in the next episode. And stay risky, everyone.